Huawei, the Chinese telecom giant, is accused of being a national security threat. Trump banned Huawei, then postponed the ban. Twice. Was it a trade war misstep, or all part of a larger plan? Welcome back to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. We are now officially more than a year into the U.S.-China trade war. But unofficially, it's been nearly two decades since the Chinese Communist Party began its trade war against the U.S., using its newfound membership in the World Trade Organization to steal American intellectual property, manipulate its currency, and twist the law to give Chinese companies an advantage. President Trump may not have started the trade war, but will he be able to finish it? I sat down with China expert Gordon Chang to find out. Thanks for joining me again, Gordon. Thank you, Chris. So almost exactly a year ago, I had you on the show, and I asked you, who do you think is winning the trade war? Now, at the time, you said it's too early to tell. So a year later, who's winning the trade war? Up until yesterday, the United States was clearly winning the trade That's war. That's what I like to hear. But today, today's a pretty dark day for the United States. Um, up until yesterday, President Trump, I think, was winning. He was imposing tariffs. He was making the Chinese hurt. And, and that's the important thing here, and that he was willing to use the power of the United States to push the Chinese in a better direction. Um, today, however, a different story. Today, um, the president gave Huawei Technologies, the Chinese telecom equipment manufacturer, a second 90-day reprieve from being on the Commerce Department's entity list. If you're on the entity list, it means no U.S. company can either license or sell technology. And, and Huawei clearly has stolen U.S. tech, but also is a national security threat. And indeed, President Trump yesterday said Huawei is a national security threat. But today, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross says, oh, we're going to allow American companies to do whatever they want for the next 90 days. That shows, uh, I think, a failure of political will. You've got to go back to the Osaka G20 at the end of June. And there was this interim arrangement between Trump and Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler. And basically, the Chinese agreed to buy more U.S. agricultural products. We agreed to give reprieves to Huawei. That's an awful deal from any number of different perspectives. Why but is the, that? Well, it's because, first of all, what we're doing is we're making ourselves look like a third world economy by selling primary products while we're giving the Chinese a free pass on high technology. So um, by uh, allowing Huawei um, to use U.S. tech, license from Google, for instance, buy Qualcomm chips, uh, we were allowing them to uh, essentially continue their lead in the fifth generation of wireless communications, 5G, the Internet of Things. This is going to, whoever controls 5G and artificial intelligence probably controls the economy of the 21st century. And we were allowing Huawei to continue its lead on us. Um, so, you know, we don't want to look like Brazil, for instance, you know, where, you know, you sell primary products. And our and soccer then, teams aren't that good. Well, <laughs> I wish our, our men's team were as good as the Brazilians, but that's a different story. But the point is, we don't want to end up to being a seller of primary products and buying manufactured goods, high-tech products from the Chinese. So it was a bad deal structured. But this story gets even worse, Chris. Okay. The story, story, is, story is that the Chinese did not agree, did not actually buy more U.S. agricultural products. They just stiffed us in that. So what does President Trump do? The Chinese dishonor their part of the deal? Well, Trump goes ahead with our part of the deal. So, you know, this really looks bad. I, I just hope this is a temporary failure of will. Um, but this is the second of these 90-day exemptions. Um, it was unwar The first one was unwarranted, as it turns out. The second one is even worse. Um, the third one, if it comes, um, is going to be a debacle. Well, so I was going to ask about this, because over the course of the trade war, you've seen the Trump administration uh, say they're going to put new tariffs on China, and then they delay the tariffs. The Huawei ban, they said they're going to ban Huawei, and then they delay that. Do you think that's sending mis mixed messages, or is it part of a broader plan by the administration? Who knows what's in Trump said, um, but when you look at it from the outside, it doesn't look good. It, it is important to impose those tariffs. Remember, these are remedies for the theft of U.S. intellectual property. And when you read the Commission on the Theft of U.S. Intellectual Property, the Blair Huntsman Report, or look at the U.S. Trade Representative's March 2018 report, 
clearly China steals hundreds of billions of dollars. You know, people can argue whether it's 150 billion or 600 billion, but the point is, even at the lower end of the range, this is a grievous wound to an innovation-based economy. So um, we've got to do whatever we can to stop the Chinese from stealing our stuff immediately. And this is separate and apart from China's violations of its World Trade Organization obligations to us. Mm -hmm. So China's getting worse in that score. Um, so it's across the board a deterioration in their behavior. Um, and so it's good that the Trump administration has identified the problem, is doing something about it, but it's not doing enough. Well, so I've heard that the ultimate goal of the trade war is not so much fixing the trade deficit. Uh, what do you think are the Trump administration's uh, long-term goals? I think the long-term goal is to disengage uh, the Chinese economy from ours, to get our factories out of China, mm -hmm. to buy from our friends, uh, or to buy from ourselves, for that matter. But if not buy from ourselves, at least buy from our friends, instead of a country that's using the proceeds of trade to build up its military, where its senior officers are openly talking gleefully about killing Americans. You know, twice in December, you had a senior Chinese military officer um, urge publicly unprovoked attacks on the U.S. Navy and the global commons. And in the second of those um, comments, you had a Chinese rear admiral say, look, he wanted to use his ballistic missiles to sink two U.S. aircraft carriers, kill 10,000 Americans. We shouldn't be trading with that country. And remember, it's more than just boasting. Last year, China lasered a U.S. C-130, temporarily caused eye injuries to two pilots. If you're trying to blind pilots of a plane, you're trying to bring it down, you're trying to kill the crew. And then also in Guangzhou, um, China used sonic attacks against the U.S. consulate, caused brain injuries to our diplomats. Um, you know, it goes on and on. So clearly we shouldn't be trading with China full stop. Um, I mean, this is just wrong. And clearly with President Trump giving the reprieve to Huawei today, that's a big mistake. Yep. So I know the People's Bank of China has allowed the value of the UN to fall versus the US dollar. Do you think that was a strategic move? I think that it was. Uh, China controls the value of its currency. Uh, it does it two ways. First of all, it's got uh, capital controls. But second of all, it, it sets a target level every trading day and it must, currency can't trade outside of a band. So um, what it did a um, couple weeks ago was, I think, move that target ban, that fixing number, um, lower. And uh, that was a signal to um, traders that the currency should go below that critical seven to one level. That's seven of the Chinese currency to one of the American currency. So China devaluing its currency, is that helpful? Well, it's helpful to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I'm not so sure that it's, it's a good thing for China, because first of all, um, by doing that, they make products to the U.S. cheaper. That certainly bolster President Trump's arguments that his tariffs are not being paid for by the American consumer. Um, so this, I think, is, is not going to be helpful for the Chinese. But there's something really more important, Chris, and for the Chinese. That is, their number one always lurking in the background problem is capital flight. Because in 2015, 2016, there was perhaps... 2.1, 2.2 trillion dollars of net capital outflow. That is a loss that could lead to the end of the Chinese economy. And by devaluing the currency, going below that important psychological seven to one level, it shows the Chinese people, look, you know, it's time to get your currency out, put it into something safer. And there's been increased evidence of gold buying on the part of the Chinese public. I think that that's largely a feeling that's informal capital flight. That's getting your money out of renminbi and putting it into a hard asset. So um, I think China is going to have a problem. If they're going to allow the currency to erode much more, um, you know, are we going to go to 8-1, 9-1, who knows? Um, China is going to have this capital flow problem. The way they fixed it last time were two things. They stabilized the value of currency, and second of all, they imposed even more draconian capital controls. Well, you can do that to stem capital outflow, but that has serious knock-on effects on the Chinese economy. People aren't going to bring money into a country if they think they can't get it out. And also, it sends some really bad signals internally. So yeah, the Chinese can devalue the currency and they can say that this is one of their tools, but in the end, it's going to hurt China far more than the United States. 
Well, this is something people have been debating for a long time, that the level of control the Chinese Communist Party has over the Chinese economy actually makes it stronger and more resilient than the U.S. economy. Do you agree with that? Well, short term, yes, you can do a number of things. So, for instance, they did not have a 2008 downturn. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world did. China didn't. Um, but what China did by um, avoiding 2008 with the massive stimulus was it created these even bigger imbalances in the Chinese economy. And at some point, there's going to be an adjustment, as economists call it. In other words, what people would call a crash. Mm -hmm. So they can do this. They control borrowers, lenders, banks, courts, everything. So they can, yeah, it, it does give them an advantage in the short term. But they're creating a problem for which there is no solution, and that is perhaps the biggest crash in history. So um, it is an advantage, but it's also a disadvantage. Remember, mm -hmm. because they have the capacity to sort of overpower the market, they do it. And the more they do it, the bigger imbalances it become, making the problems even more insoluble. So there is a real cost to all of this. Well, speaking of these sort of corrections, it's been 10 years since uh, the U.S. had a recession. Some people say we're due for another one. If that happens, how do you think that will shift the balance of power between the U.S. and China? Well, that would certainly shift the balance of uh, power more to the Chinese side, of course. I mean, when you look at the yield curve, the inverted yield curve, um, where you have your 10-year treasuries trading um, well below uh, shorter-term maturities, yeah, that is a sign of, of a recession to come. And when you see that, it means a recession will come. Um, so yes, it's coming. But the, whether it's coming two, three years down the road, we just don't know. And oftentimes, there's a big lag between uh, the yield, cur yield curve going inverted and a US recession. Um, and I think part of what we're seeing right now is, is the yields changing, not so much as a reflection of what people think about the US economy, but what people in other countries are thinking about their economy you know, it stinks outside, so they're bringing their money into safe havens like 10-year treasury obligations. So I think that's part of it. Also, you got to remember that recessions are inevitable, just as recoveries are inevitable in free markets. So yes, a recession is coming, but whether it's, you know, when, I, I think it's probably pretty far down the road. In other words, I think it's farther down the road, and it's not going to help China in the near term, which is really what we're talking about. Even with the election coming up. Yeah, even with the election coming up. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible to have a recession between now and November 2020. I think that it's probably unlikely. Um, so uh, this is, of course, something only time will tell. But when you start to look at, at past recessions, past patterns, um, yeah, a recession will be coming, but probably not in time to affect the election. Um, so what do you think the economic tools are that the Chinese Communist Party possesses to uh, attack the U.S.? Uh, they don't really have very many tools. What, they've got things that they can do, Chris, mm -hmm. but those things are going to hurt China more than they're going to hurt us. So as a practical matter, they don't have tools. The, on this trade war, the, the only thing that China would have as an advantage would be political will. Mm -hmm. And up until today, I thought that Trump had more political will than Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm not quite so sure. Um, and the president, um, our president, I think has got a long way to go to show to the American public that he's willing to defend our economy. So right now, financially speaking, what is the average Chinese citizen feeling uh, versus the average American citizen? In China, it's really hard to say there's an average because the disparity is so great. I mean, your typical Communist Party cadre who's making millions and millions it, Mostly probably. on the side. Mo all on the side. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that they're feeling uh, going to feel it. But when you start looking at the numbers for the economy, you've got to be very concerned. China reported 6.3% growth for the first half of this year. Really unlikely, especially when you go back and you start looking at the underlying indicators for, for instance, June and July. Um, pretty horrible. Um, and um, the, their indication of really soft domestic demand. Most important thing are, are the soft import numbers, because that really reflects what the demand is inside China. But even some of the consumer numbers, you know, everyone's saying, oh, you know, China no longer has a manufacturing based economy. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good because the manufacturing PMIs are, are both flashing red. But even if you were to say manufacturing isn't important for China anymore, which I think is wrong, nonetheless, you know, car sales are down in July, 13th straight month. You know, mm -hmm. 
This year is going to be negative on car sales as opposed to last year. That's a bellwether sign of the economy and of faith in, in uh, Chinese people of their own economy. You got to go back to December of last year when you had that professor at Renmin University who said that in 2018 the Chinese economy was going to grow no more than 1.67% and might even contract. And China comes out with this number, oh, we grew 6.6% in 2018. Uh-uh. That's not the case. I mean, we can argue all day about where the Chinese economy is in reality, but it's probably a lot closer to zero than it is to six. Well, a lot of people have said that the trade war is essentially an existential threat for the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah. I mean, when you set yourself up as an all-powerful, invincible, infallible organization, everything, Chris, is an existential threat, but the economy is even more so. And, and that's because, as people say, and it's absolutely correct, that, you know, the party has said that the continual delivery of prosperity shows the wisdom of Communist Party rule. If your economy is crumbling, it shows that maybe the Communist Party isn't infallible, infallible and shouldn't be ruling. Um, but it creates grievances, and it creates grievances at a pretty bad time for China. Um, so I, I think that it is a, very much a, a, an issue which does threaten the continued rule of the party, as does, for instance, Hong Kong, as does for a number of things. So you think there's still some hope for the free market? Yeah, there's a, there's a great hope for the free market. Um, I mean, ultimately, free markets prevail. Sometimes it takes decades, as we saw in the case of the Cold War. But, um, you know, during the Cold War, we thought the Soviet economy was doing really well. You know, the CIA would come up with all these estimates about how they're outperforming us. And indeed, the Russia, uh, the Soviet Union was winning the Cold War when people thought that the Soviet economy was productive, that it was outpacing ours. Well, you know, we've gone through this same sort of pattern with regard to China. Uh, and now people are starting to say, oh, maybe the Chinese economy isn't that great. And I think what we're going to witness going forward essentially will be people saying, oh, my God, the place is over there is falling apart. Um, we, made, we better have, renew our commitment to democracy. <laughs> it, it's going to happen. So in the end, do you think there will be a trade deal? Uh, I don't. If, if you're talking decades down the road, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but right now, uh, I don't. Um, and I think part of it is because I think the Chinese political system looks frozen right now. There's a certain amount of paralysis. It's, un it's got a siege mentality because it's got the trade war, it's got the crumbling economy, it's got Hong Kong. And of course, it's got fights among various factions at the top, which I think have been exacerbated by all of these problems. When you're an all-powerful ruler, it's great when things are going well for your country, such as in 2017 for Xi Jinping. You fast forward two years, 2019, things ain't going so well. Xi Jinping has nobody to blame um, because he's divested, he's taken power from everybody, which means he's taken accountability. He's accumulated that for himself. I mean, he, when in 2012, when he became General Secretary of the Communist Party, it was a collective system. Nobody got blamed for good things. Nobody got really praised for, I mean, for bad, bad things. Nobody got really praised for good things because everyone was in on the decision. Now that's not the case. And also, of course, because Xi Jinping has deinstitutionalized the party, he's gotten rid of those rules that constrained him, but those were rules that also protected him. So while people say Trump is facing election in November 2020, Xi Jinping faces an election every day. And the worst that can happen to Trump is that he doesn't get elected, re-elected. But the worst that can happen to Xi Jinping is pretty bad. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Gordon. It was another insightful interview. Well, thank you so much, Chris.